It's really a delight also for me to have the chance to introduce her, uh, Miss Linda Melvern. Linda Melvern is an investigative journalist. She's also an honorary professor in the Department of International Politics at the University of Wales, uh, Eberswith. She's a consultant to the Military One Prosecution Team and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and she has conducted a huge amount of research in the area of the Rwanda genocide. She has written six books of nonfiction and is widely published in the British press and academic journals. She is the second vice president of the Inter International Association of Genocide Scholars. Her nonfiction works include A People Betrayed, the role in the West in Rwanda's genocide, and Conspiracy to Murder, the Rwandan Genocide. A news reporter on the London Evening Standard, for several years, Linda Melvern worked for the London Sunday Times, including on the investigative insight team. Please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Ms. Linda Melvern. Thank you. Thank you for asking me to come today to share with you uh, what is now some 17 years research into the circumstances of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. Um, I'm rather haunted this morning. Uh, I came in just in time to hear Roy Bennett. And I don't know whether you remember his plea uh, just as he finished the last question. Um, about Zimbabwe. Black on black violence, who cared? And this is exactly uh, the position when it comes to the 1994 genocide of the Tutsi uh, in Rwanda. On Thursday, April the 7th, 1994, several hundred soldiers from the elite French-trained para-commando battalion left their barracks on the outskirts of the capital, Kigali, and they were assigned to specific residential areas in the city. They carried with them orders from their high command to kill anyone who carried a Tutsi identity card. As the sun came up that morning, roadblocks had sealed the exits to the city, and in one parish, Hutu power militia, trained to kill at speed and indoctrinated with a racist ideology, were taking control of the streets. Moving from house to house, the militia was killing whole families with machetes. In the central hospital, Kigali, the bodies were piling up outside the morgue. In the north of Rwanda, in Gisenyi, identified Tutsi families were taken away on lorries, driven to a public cemetery known as the Commune Rouge, where they were killed. By nightfall, on April the 7th, Rwanda's political opposition had been almost entirely wiped out. Every lawyer, every journalist, every teacher, every civil servant, every Rwandan who had worked towards a power-sharing democratic system of government was hunted down. The Prime Minister, the head of the Constitutional Court, the Foreign Minister, the Minister for Social Affairs, all of them were murdered. One week later, on Thursday, April the 14th, 1994, the International Committee of the Red Cross, which had maintained a presence in the capital, estimated that 10,000 people a day were being killed. They were being driven from their homes, assembled in public places, in churches, schools, and hospitals, Local administrators organized the disposal of bodies in garbage trucks. Crates of weapons were unloaded from jeeps at the roadblocks. The organizational nature of the killing was clear. In the third week, the genocide continued to spread. In the southern city of Butar, Tutsi students at the university were rounded up taken to the Arboretum and shot. 
in the prefecture of Butare at a Catholic church, an estimated 20,000 people were killed in the course of three days. By May the 11th, the Red Cross had identified 91 sites across the country where 756,000 people were trapped. They were in constant fear of their lives. They were starving and injured. The Red Cross called it a genocide in full view. By now, the evidence was escaping the country. Hundreds of bodies were floating down the Kagera River. Thousands of bodies washed up on the shores of Lake Victoria. In the genocide, the rape of women was so extensive that subsequently, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda took the historic step of redefining the 1948 Genocide Convention and determined that sexual violence constituted a genocidal act. Afterwards, three months, it started on April the 6th and ended on July the 17th. It was ascertained that most victims were killed in large scale massacres. Children and the elderly were mostly killed by machete. Most young adults were killed by firearms. Most of the victims were under 24 years old. In Kigali, from a previous population of 300,000 people, there were 50,000 people left, and half of them were displaced. Outside the capital, whole families and communities had disappeared. Livestock had been killed, and crops lain to waste. Everywhere, there were ditches filled with rotting bodies. People had been terrorized and traumatized. The hospitals and schools were destroyed. Rwanda's health centers, one in each commune, were ruined. The stocks of basic drugs and health supplies had been looted. Water supply lines were non-operational. Qualified staff had been killed or fled the country, including most of the teachers. In the whole country, there were six judges and ten lawyers left alive. At least 100,000 children had been separated from their families, orphaned, lost, abducted or abandoned. Most of Rwanda's children had witnessed extreme forms of brutality and 90% of them had at some point thought they would die. These figures come from a report of UNICEF. Most children felt they had no future. They did not believe that they would live to become adults. More than 300 children, some less than 10 years old, were accused of genocide or murder. An estimated 300,000 children had been killed. The genocide, as I say, lasted three months. In those three months, it is estimated that up to one million Rwandans were murdered. A society was created in those three months that was based on genocide. I was in New York in April 1994 at the United Nations Secretariat. I was completing a book on the 50-year history of the UN, and the book was being filmed for Channel 4 television for the 50th anniversary of the United Nations. I'm most grateful for the access I have been given in the last 17 years. I have interviewed UN peacekeepers who were present in the country at the time, perpetrators, the genocidaires themselves, and diplomats, Kofi Annan, gave me access to the archives of the UN assistance mission for Rwanda. In Rwanda, I was given a, access to a vast archive of documents, the government archives of the perpetrators. In all seven ministries in Rwanda, in the capital, were found intact, including the president's 
own office. Um, the Convention on the Punishment and Prevention of the Crime of Genocide was the world's first human rights treaty. And it stood for a fundamental and important principle that whenever genocide threatened any group or nation or people, it was a matter of concern, not just for that group, but for the whole of humanity. The convention preceded the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by 24 hours, and it was the first truly universal, comprehensive, and codified protection of human rights. The Universal Declaration is an affirmation. The Genocide Convention is a treaty. And that means that compliance is not a choice, but an obligation. The Genocide Convention enshrined the never again promise, the world's response to the Nazi Holocaust in Europe. Raphael Lemkin, a Polish lawyer who coined the word genocide, who is known as the father of the convention, believed that the crime implied the existence of a coordinated plan of action, a conspiracy to be put into effect against people chosen as victims, purely, simply, and exclusively because they were members of a target group. Lemkin explained that genocide was not a sudden and abominable aberration. It was a deliberate attempt to reconstruct the world. Genocide is part of history, he wrote. It follows humanity like a dark shadow from early antiquity to the present time. Genocide in this case then, can be predicted. And with an international early warning system, it could be prevented. The key elements in genocide are effective propaganda to spread a racist ideology that defines the victim outside human existence, as vermin and as subhuman. It requires a dependence on military security and a certainty that outside interference would be at a minimum. And so exactly it was in Rwanda. The reason I decided to write a book was because someone in 1994 leaked to me an account of what was said in the secret meetings of the UN Security Council to decide what to do about Rwanda. In the first four weeks, the fact of mass civilian slaughter was hardly discussed at all. The focus of attention in these meetings was what to do about the UN peacekeeping mission that was in Rwanda. It had come to monitor a transition from a 20-year dictatorship to a power-sharing democracy. The UK's ambassador in the second week of April, Lord David Hannay, would claim the situation in Rwanda was just like Somalia. Nothing could be done about it. It was anarchy and chaos. This was not the case. Rwanda was more like Northern Ireland than anywhere else. A power sharing possibility between a minority and a majority people. The UK government gave Northern Ireland decades to achieve what it has now achieved. In Rwanda, under an international peace agreement, Rwanda was given just two years to solve problems that had started at least from 1959. There is also a claim, particularly I think of Madeleine Albright, who was the US ambassador in the council at the time, that they did not understand in the council what was happening. They had no idea about this civilian slaughter. I have spent the last seven year, 17 years 
proving her wrong. To say that ambassadors and governments did not know what is happening is extraordinary to me. The International Committee of the Red Cross was extremely well informed. Indeed, on May the 4th, 1994, Oxfam delivered a petition to number 10 Downing Street, along with the actress Helen Mirren, to say that what was happening in Rwanda was like Cambodia, and that anyone but a fool knew that military intervention was the answer. The decision to withdraw the peacekeepers from Rwanda was a UK initiative. It was the United Kingdom, not the US, who asked for the peacekeepers to, to be withdrawn. And as you know, they were. It was decided that 270 could stay behind with Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire in order, as the UK ambassador said, to appease public opinion. In the end, 470 volunteer peacekeepers stayed behind and some of them did their best to save as many people as they could. I have written about the very worst that humankind can do, but I've also written about the very best. Philippe Gaillard, the chief delegate of the Red Cross, given a choice on April the 7th, whether or not to stay in Rwanda had not hesitated, and there was an ICRC presence in Rwanda throughout. He told me it was a drop of humanity in an ocean of blood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask? Thank you. My name is Fatima Blushi. I'm from University of Exeter. Um, I would like to inquire um, in your research or book on uh, what happened in Rwanda, how far you are, um, you are considering the tribal background of the country. You have compared what happened there to other countries, but from, from understanding that we have similarities from uh, the Middle Eastern region with Africa uh, region, especially uh, tra the, traditional, uh, the uh, traditional cultural background, tribal issues are very difficult to be, to be healed in such incidents. And um, I support this by, I had an internship in one of UN organizations, and I met uh, people from other African countries who visited Rwanda just recently, and they still think that there is something in the air between the people. It's, it's not even in the process of healing, um, and it's not element of, um, of what is really in, in the media, it's how people are traumatized that neighbors targeted them and their children. There are people walking in the street and pe other people are looking at them and they know that this person has killed their, uh, uh, their son or their daughter. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I take, okay. Um, I'll take your, your last point first. There is one word that I would never use with a Rwandan, and that is reconciliation. How do you reconcile? And who are we now to go to Rwanda and say, where is your reconciliation? Why aren't you living in harmony? My expertise, I think, is the genocide itself and not Rwanda now. But that is what I have to say. I think that reconciliation is probably impossible at the moment. These are not tribes. The people in Rwanda are not divided into tribes. The division Hutu and Tutsi is, is a division, if you like, a social division. Um, they speak the same language. They have this amazing language called Kinyarwanda, which is very expressive and very poetic. 
um, they have the same culture. It is an oral tradition of history, the same myths, the same legends. The, uh, I urge you to read A People Betrayed because I did a revised edition of it in 2009. And I had the benefit then of these two remarkable historians, American historians, David and Catherine Newbery, who have written, if you like, the history of the division in society. Um, one um, episode in that, which I'd like to describe to you, was the Belgian colonizer in 1933 um, had this bureaucratic exercise in Rwanda where it measured everybody's nose, looked at Adam's apple, and decided who was a Tutsi and who wasn't a Tutsi. You know, Voltaire said, uh, people who believe in absurdities create atrocities. <laughs> And it's true. Um, so everyone was given an identity card with either Hutu, Tutsi, or Twa. The first decision of the government in 1994 was to do away with the ethnic um, division on the identity card. So it is, it is not tribal. The problem was that in 1994, in April, when the genocide started, the Western press which was completely obsessed with former Yugoslavia, um, dismissed Rwanda very much and said it was tribal anarchy and chaos, and this happens in Africa, doesn't it? I mean, there was this institutional racism, I would suggest, not just in the Security Council, but in the Western media. It wasn't tribal and it wasn't chaos. It was a very carefully planned and systematic slaughter of a minority. They didn't want to share power with the Tutsi, so they decided, quite simply, is a political tool to eliminate them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Chibia from Nigeria. Um, given your narration as to the intensity of the um, genocide, <coughs> as well as your belief, carefully planned over a period um, when you have reason to think so. And also your statement that uh, the people are uh, the same, they speak the same language, they live together. Do you think it was not possible for the Tutsis to have known about the plan? I mean, they are living together, they speak the same language. How could such a grandiose plan be hatched over a long period? carefully kept away, secret, without the other party knowing that is one. Two, um, do you, did you ever have reason to look at the role of Belgium and France in all this? Because whatever thesis you write, or anybody else who writes about any part of Africa, any part, any conflict, which leads to whatever, would be incomplete without a proper diagnosis of colonial power and impact and what they did and the role they played and continue to play in today in Africa. And then when it comes to taking some responsibility for the kind of politics, they sit back and decide, oh well, then like someone came this morning and talked about Mugabe and talking about Britain, without bothering to know. I'm not a fan of um, Mugabe, and I'm not trying to take the truck back. But that gentleman was just one-sided, pure and simple. OK, so maybe you would help us by clar clarifying some of these issues. Thank you. Um, first of all, it wasn't a secret plan at all. It was uh, outlined in the local newspaper in one of the newspapers that was pro of this ideology Hutu power. Um, a final solution is being prepared for the Tutsi people, was in uh, one edition of Kangura. Um, Philippe Gaillard of the Red Cross in January 1994 started to stockpile medicines at the central hospital in Kigali. 
and had ordered tents to be put up uh, because he realised that a genocide was being planned. A British journalist turned up in Kigali in January 1994 and Philippe Gaillard said to him, a genocide is being planned. And the journalist didn't believe him. He said, I saw no evidence of it at all. In fact, it wasn't a secret um, at all. Tutsi were leaving the country. The UN in uh, February 1994 established safe areas for Tutsi to sleep at night because they were so threatened. Uh, you know, I expect that Lieutenant General Dallaire uh, met an informer who told him that large numbers of machete and weapons had been stockpiled. Um, none of this information, by the way, seemed to have reached the Security Council of the United Nations, which had set up uh, uh, the United Nations Assistance Mission for Rwanda, UNAMIR, to monitor this transition from a dictatorship to a power-sharing democracy. I urge you to read the revised edition of A People Betrayed. I do not uh, gloss over the role of Belgium. The role of Belgium is quite extraordinary. The more you learn about it, the more terrible it becomes. Belgium had troops in Rwanda as the backbone of Unimir, 450 troops as a backbone. They decided to withdraw immediately. There was no discussion in the Belgian government about what could be done. The commander of, uh, I'm sorry? They had the 10 killed, but the commander, Luc Marshall, of the Belgium uh, unit said that if we withdraw, we are going to condemn thousands and thousands of people to death. Um, the role of France, I was recently in Paris, and there is work being done there by some remarkable journalists into the role of France. That, too, is incredible. I explained to you the, the, what happened on the 7th with the paracommando unit. There were senior French officers embedded in those units. They were living in the barracks. And French officers, these senior military officers, have given testimony at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda in defense of genocidaire. The Mitterrand archives are still closed. Um, the policy of France was directed by François Mitterrand in the Africa unit of the Elysee. The only documents available so far have come anonymously on a CD-ROM. And Mitterrand and other officials in the Africa unit were convinced that the trouble with Rwanda was that there had been an invasion by the rebel, mainly Tutsi RPF, on behalf of hundreds and thousands of Tutsi who had been expelled from the country. This was Rwanda's largest, this was Africa's largest refugee problem. Mitterrand did not see it that way. He saw it as an invasion from an Anglophone country into a Francophone area of Africa because the Anglophones, i.e. the US and the UK, wanted to take over Rwanda to achieve the exploitation of the great wealth in the neighboring DRC. And if you look at Rwanda now, the worst fears of these operatives, the mercenaries and the military who were in Rwanda have been realized. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm a Vietnam veteran. And um, I make very, very little distinction between France and England, the United States. Um, there's this talk about genocide. And I would categorize the war on the people of Southeast Asia as being genocide. But no one is ever taken to task, ever. So that's a problem that's endemic to this situation here. That the people who, the main perpetrators of genocide are never taken to task. So we have this uneven uh, attention being given to one genocide or another. I think it's a problem a very serious problem, not 
to bring those, all of those who are guilty of genocide to justice. I'd like you to speak to why that situation, if you agree, exists. And then it's inconceivable for me as a, as a former soldier to listen to you say that there were people who were embedded from European armies in these neo-colonial armies and that there was not traffic that, we, that you're probably not even aware of about what was going on. It's clear you know, there was uh, uh, people ignored the situation to the extent that millions of people died. But that's not, that's not, there's nothing uncommon about that. And one other point, that genocide takes on many forms. You know, it manifests itself, itself in many ways. It's not just the decap decapitated bodies on the street. It's not just that. It's many different things. And I just want you to speak to those a few areas, if you will. Um, I'll take the last point first, that genocide is many things it is. You know, some uh, commentators have written that the genocide was over because the killing was mainly over uh, in mid-May. But there were 91 sites all over Rwanda with people trapped. They were starving. They were being snatched at night by the intra -hamway. They were being uh, tortured, raped. Uh, that is, too, is genocidal. I agree with you. From the point of view of an, of an investigative journalist, um, I do see my role as trying to hold the decision makers to account. The government of John Major, Malcolm Rifkind, Douglas Hurd, the administration of Bill Clinton, who went to Rwanda in 1997, Bill Clinton, and stood at Kigali Airport with the engines of Air Force One still running, and said, I did not realize the terror that was engulfing you. He denied that he knew. Madeleine Albright, who was the ambassador in the Security Council, saying she did not fully understand what the military options were. Um, these people, I do believe that had these people lost their reputations over their decision-making over Rwanda, we would not now be looking at Darfur. You, you know, it's a very important point to make. Bill Clinton will be remembered for Monica Lewinsky. That is the one scandal that will define his administration. Shame on the press for that. When Malcolm Rifkind is profiled in the paper, not a word about Rwanda. Madeleine Albright, in fact, was interviewed on... Um, the programme for women in the morning on Radio 4, Woman's Hour. She wasn't asked once about Rwanda. How could these people sit day after day in the Security Council knowing what was happening in Rwanda? I find that extraordinary. Perpetrators, here we have another problem. You're quite right. The original list of Category 1 perpetrators in Rwanda, and I mean people who incited, organized, financed, killed. There are 240. At the ICTR, 60 are either in prison, convicted, or going through a trial. The majority of people who organized and perpetrated the genocide in Rwanda have escaped. There are several hundred local administrators in the UK. I was on the bus the other day, the number 38 going down the Essex Road, and there was Dr. Vincent Bajina, an alleged genocidaire who was arrested in this country. There was a trial. Magistrate court in Westminster said that he should be taken back to Rwanda. Appeal court decides he can't be because of the fears that he wouldn't get 
uh, a proper trial, so he is now free and living in London. The Security Council, for reasons of economy, have decided that the International Criminal Tribunal should close. This isn't the attitude with perpetrators of the Holocaust at all. It's different when it comes to Rwanda. And once I said to General Dallaire, who lived through this, and I'm sure you're familiar, I said, why? It's still a question that we all have to ask. And he said, too small, too poor, and too black. Uh, hello, my name is Julieta Gonzalez. Um, I'm Mexican uh, journalist, and uh, you said you write, you've written about the, the worst and also about the, um, yeah, the best. And I'd, um, it's um, what, 18 years almost since um, since the the genocide in Rwanda, and I would like to 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 know from you how would you assess the recent, the most recent responses of the international community on the. Mo what have been like the most recent um, or yeah or salient cases of genocide, for instance. Therefore, do you think the international response has uh, has improved? Are there any good practices or efficient practices that um, you would regard as you know as, as yes as um, yeah that you would encourage you know the community um, to keep on yeah doing anyway. That's my point. It's a very short answer. I'm not encouraged at all. I'm really not encouraged. Uh, with Darfur, I think you, you must be aware there was a big campaign. There's been a big campaign about genocide in Darfur. But we're not holding the politicians to account for their decision making. We are not going through the democratic process. If Bill Clinton had been held responsible and shamed for what his, you know, there hasn't even been an inquiry. The best inquiry into what happened in Rwanda is from the Belgian Senate, which did have the, the, the grace to actually declassify the traffic, the telegrams between Kigali and Brussels. There's been no inquiry in the UK at all. While the genocide progressed in May, there was one MP who raised the issue in the House. There was no debate. There has been no inquiry in the US at all. Canada recently, there was an Institute of uh, Genocide Studies in Canada, and Madeleine Albright was actually on the inquiry. And she said, as I've said, you know, we did not understand what the military options were. Well, that's very, very strange because when the pressure was on at the beginning of May, when the world was finally waking up because the evidence was leaking out of the country, Lieutenant General Dallaire said 5,500 troops could protect the civilians. A delegation was sent from the Pentagon to the UN to try to persuade Kofi Annan that the best action would be to create safe havens on the borders. And Dallaire pointed out the people will be killed while they're trying to get to the safe havens. So for Madeleine Albright to say she didn't understand is incredible to me. Thank you for that question. Okay. If we can, let's take one more question, uh, and then maybe while we're, uh, I'll, I'll give it there. Someone said someone in the back, I guess, was waiting for a while, my colleague told me. I also want to do a brief announcement and or request. So the initial plan I suggested to you is that we would break now uh, and have a lunch until 2. I'm happy that Ms. Castelli is here already. She was the speaker who was supposed to speak at 1.30. She unfortunately needs to leave by 2, and there's no chance that she can stay later. So, uh, we're talking about human rights here. I know you have a human right to lunch, uh, but if you would agree, what I would be very happy what we could do uh, is let's have the speech of Ms. Castelli now, uh, and then we'll have a little bit more comfortable uh, lunch break, let's say from 1.30 until 2.30, 2.45. Um, I think that would be the best way. I don't want to lose uh, Ms. Castelli, and then uh, we also have a chance at least to get a little fresh air. 
Uh, is this a tremendous breach of human rights, or uh, are we able to do that? Because if so, what I'd suggest, there is still coffee in the back. If you need you know, a little sip of coffee, uh, let's maybe take one more question, uh, and then I think it'd be great just to, I don't want to lose the opportunity to also hear Ms. Castelli. So I'm not seeing too much protest, so I'm hoping this is okay. Uh, and I'm not sure if you can help me democratically. I'm not sure who is next. My colleague told me someone in the back was waiting, but uh, can you help me? Darnell's, okay, right here, okay. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Melbourne, for your um, presentation. How much uh, fault will we, must we lie on the media? I have a friend, uh, Sam Husseini, who was recently suspended from the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., for raising critical questions to the Saudi prince about issues in Saudi Arabia. And how much fault lies with the media? I'm probably um, the right or the wrong person to, to, to ask this question. I left the Sunday Times when Rupert Murdoch bought it. Okay? Um, because um, I was used to doing long-term investigative work. Um, and it was clear then that there would be another agenda at the paper, so I left. And I'm very, very critical, um, as you've heard, of the uh, Western media's response, uh, all uh, the Western media. I mean, I'm not excusing The Guardian here. You know, on the 10th of April, they had a picture uh, from Rwanda of a dog being evacuated that belonged to an ambassador. So shame all round, actually, for the genocide in Rwanda. Good for your friend to actually ask that question. And uh, I'm sorry he's been thrown out, but I think that's a badge of honor, quite frankly. And on that note, if I could please ask for your assistance in extending our gratitude.